Since 1887, the Stonington Free Library has been a center for knowledge, ideas, creativity, and entertainment. It is a comfortable and welcoming community space for the town of Stonington, Connecticut, where all ages can explore, discover, gather and learn within a building of distinctive and unique architecture. This video program is an evolution to expand the offerings of the library to share directly in your home or organization. Welcome to the Sunday Evening Lecture Series made available to you by the Stonington Free Library. Ted, I think that was the best introduction I've ever heard. <laughs> Thank you very much. Something about Ted Danforth. He has um, spent the last, uh, I'd say, 10 years of his life intensively studying the Middle East, uh, writing about it, as many of you know. And, you know, he's building bridges and building understanding. That's exactly what we need in this world today. So thank you very much, Ted, for all that, that you're doing. Um, and thank you to the Stonington Free Library and the LaGrua Center. What a great partnership. It says a lot about your institutions that you would choose to do in a, an event like this today. And I think it says a lot about our community that all of you came out on a beautiful day, uh, like today as well, uh, on this day of reflection and remembrance. Uh, this is a very special day for our nation and for our region as well. You know, 15 years ago today, we lost members of this community right here. Uh, Josh Piver was from Stonington, and the daughter and four-year-old granddaughter of Paula Clifford Scott from Mystic were also lost that day. Uh, and I'm sure that many of you also know people that were touched by what happened on 9-11. So if we could just have a brief uh, moment of silence and reflection for them and for all who were lost. Thank you. Fifteen years ago today, on a morning bright and clear, the world as we knew it changed and came to an end. For generations, America's rise from rural isolation to global power had been a story of aspiration and accomplishment. In a world of feuding global powers and empires, our land was something new in the history of man a nation of the people, by the people, and for the people. Somehow different, and a break from eras of history marked by kings and queens, dictators and strong men. For example, remember those gallant men and women, women of Stonington who from this very spot had the audacity to stand against an empire in 1814. They were free men and women building a new world with new hope. Our choice to be the land of the free seemed ratified as blessed by destiny. Our population grew 100-fold across the years, and our dominion stretched across a continent and beyond. For almost 200 years, America acted upon the world, and the world did not act upon America. We avoided the global conflagration of the Second World War, until our territorial outpost at Pearl Harbor was attacked. From that moment forward, America mobilized, and once again, we acted upon the world. America saved the world from fascism, faced down communism, and restored hope by rebuilding the old world and East Asia. Why, after that, we even went to the moon. All was upward. America's story was one of challenges met, made and challenges met. Generations of Americans grew up with the surety that they were safe from the storms that swept the world. There was safety and security on our shores and in our homes. But on September 11, 2001, that era came to an end. In a terrible instant, we all understood that for us, the world had changed. The very symbols of our strength were shaken it was a strike from the shadows by an insidious foe of whom we knew little 
and whose methods were the stuff of nightmares. And so we rallied, as Americans do, and we girded for war. As in the past, this is what you do when you're under attack. We mobilized at home. We built a security structure to protect us from future foreign invaders. We doubled the border patrol, put thousands of air marshals in our skies, spent billions on border walls, strengthened law enforcement, and tripled the budget of the FBI. We responded to the attacks that came from the hellscape that was Afghanistan by projecting massive military force across to the other side of the globe. We unleashed a preventive war in Iraq in a bid to transform the Middle East, as it was said, all in the hope that our actions and by our actions we might restore a world in which America was safe and secure from terrorist threat. Safe from the kind of shock we felt on 9-11. Secure from the fear of living in a world where madmen could do us harm. Fifteen years have passed since that clear autumn day when the Twin Towers were brought down, when innocents were lost and our world was changed. Fifteen years later, and where are we now? The national unity and sense of purpose we felt in the days after 9-11 has faded somewhat. Our bid to tame a turbulent world was lost in the deserts of the Middle East. Quick victories faded into the prospect of endless conflict. And the war on terror turned into a long twilight struggle against unseen enemies that tore at the fabric of our Constitution and has tested the very notion of who we are as a people. The trillions of dollars spent, the thousands of lives lost in our quest for security has left us seemingly no more secure against terrorist attack than we were on that autumn morning 15 years ago today. And yet, we are better prepared. We are more likely to prevent such future outrages. We can respond and recover to terrorist attacks better today than we could 15 years ago. Since September 11th, our military has dealt a devastating blow against Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda's command and control network has been shattered. They have failed to carry out any similar spectacular and coordinated attacks against the United States. While there have been acts of terror inspired by the poisonous ideology spawned by bin Laden, that is true, we have as a nation moved forward while he lies dead in a watery and forgotten grave. Why do I say we're safer against the terrorist attacks uh, today than we were on 9-11? Well, in the first months after the attacks of September 11th, I had the good fortune uh, to be named the first senior policy advisor on the U.S. House Homeland Security Committee in Congress. And I remember in those days our sense of urgency and purpose to imagine all the potential threats and to think of ways to protect ourselves. More than once, after talking with experts in many fields, we had yellow pads, it was before the iPad, and we wrote down all the potential vulnerabilities that we might imagine. The list was staggering and sadly grew day by day. But over time, rather than become overwhelmed by our fears, we began to do what they call in the private sector risk analysis. We have limited resources and we have to choose priorities. We can't guard against every eventuality, but instead we need to reduce risk where possible. And so we did what's called a threat vulnerability assessment. So first let's look at the threat part of it, the potential threats to the American homeland today. Uh, and in particular, the threats that might arise out of violent extremism emanating from the Middle East. I just returned from the Middle East yesterday afternoon. Uh, it was my 35th trip uh, to that region since my first mission to Afghanistan in the months after 9-11. I can't claim to be an expert because all I've learned from those trips is that each time I come back, I know less than I did before I went. It's a very complex place. However, I do have some impressions to share. Before 9-11, Al-Qaeda operated with near impunity. They were plotting and planning against America in our interest and our interests around the world. Bin Laden offered a powerful vision of the future for those who wished 
to return to the glories of a mythical past. Unite, rise up, he said. Drive out the crusaders from the Middle East and overthrow those corrupt Arab rulers propped up by American power. Bin Laden used his attacks against America to gain followers. And in 2001, his strategy was working. Yet he and his followers overplayed their hand. America was not alone in losing innocence to terrorist attacks. Al-Qaeda killed civilians in places like London and Madrid, but they also murdered many more civilians in places like Casablanca, Riyadh, Amman, in Yemen, and in Tunisia. There are those who say that Muslims do not denounce the radical, violent extremist groups like Al-Qaeda and ISIS. Well, uh, while I was in Morocco, and let me quote to you from King Mohammed VI, he said while I was there, quote, those who engage in terrorism in the name of Islam will dwell in hell forever. Strong words. He went on to call on Muslims, Christians, and Jews to unite together against the likes of ISIS. I do a lot of work in Jordan. Jordan was the place where you may remember one of their pilots who was doing missions against uh, ISIS was captured and burned alive. Um, and the king of Jordan has united his people in the struggle against ISIS. So you see, we are not alone in our search for security. And while it may be easy to think that the Middle East is a cauldron of chaos, we do have friends and allies in that region, and there are hundreds of millions of people who view Al-Qaeda and ISIS as threats to their immediate security. Yes, the terrorist threat, threats from ISIS and a lunatic fringe that would uh, kill in the name of Islam, those threats are real. But we must think about these threats in perspective and remember our great success against Al-Qaeda. There are some who say that the future is dark, that the rise of ISIS foreshadows a world of dystopian disorder. But we have learned in these past years, and rather than lash out in righteous fury, the armed forces of the United States, guided by an intelligence community of unrivaled capabilities and supported by a diplomatic corps, that has built a global alliance, have rolled back the latest threat, and we have them on the run. Since its rise in 2014, ISIS, the latest manifestation of violent extremism in the Middle East, has suffered defeat after defeat and lost up to half of its territory. And so rather than threaten to carpet bomb the Middle East, as one senator suggested, or seize oil fields, use torture, and kill innocent civilians, as one candidate for high office has threatened to do, I would suggest that we have to build our alliances, maintain our focus, and continue to target the terrorists. If we continue on that path, we can keep the enemy off balance while denying them the new recruits that they crave for their cause. Well, what about here at home? That's the threat part. What about our vulnerabilities? Um, we are better, better able to prevent terrorist attacks at home than before 9-11. Law enforcement at all levels works together in unprecedented coordination, and they have prevented many plots from moving past the planning stage. First responders are much better prepared and equipped than at any time in American history to meet the challenges presented by domestic terrorism. To be sure, there's more to be done, and there always will be. For example, 98% of the funding that goes to the Transportation Security Agency, your friends that search you at the airport, 98% of that goes to aviation security. But we need to prioritize screening the cargo containers that come into our ports and securing the trains that travel through our towns and cities. So we do have to do more. We should provide more training and exercises for law enforcement and first responders so that we can prevent and respond to terrorist attacks. We need to devote more resources to intelligence analysis so we can detect plots before they develop. Since 9-11, America's armed forces, intelligence analysts, diplomats, law enforcement officers, and first responders have all answered the call. Their collective actions have disrupted Al-Qaeda, rolled back ISIS, and made it better, made all of us better able to prevent, respond, and recover to terrorist incidents that might occur in the United States. Yet whether or not terrorists win, 
is actually ultimately up to all of us. The definition of terrorism is the use of violence, specifically targeting civilians, to achieve an outcome. So the real meaning of 9-11 will be determined by each of us. The real test comes down to how we answer the question, do we allow ourselves to see a dark world defined by the lunatic acts of a tiny and twisted group of cast-offs? Or do we choose to make our own destiny? Do we build walls, withdraw in fear, and lash out in frustration? Or do we build a future informed by the hard realities of life, but inspired by the fact that we can meet and master the challenges before us, as Americans always have, and I believe, always will. My friends, it is up to us. May God bless all those who were taken from us on 9-11, and may he give us the strength and wisdom and courage to honor them by continuing to build a better world, one person and one act at a time. Thank you. So now I think I can um, entertain some of your questions and comments. And before I start, I just wanted to point out my friend Paula Clifford Scott, who I mentioned at the top of the program. Thank you for being with us today, Paula. Thank you. Yes, please, Jack. Scott, uh, I, I understand that the, the, the dilemma that our current administration is uh, placed and I shudder to think how a subsequent administration may respond. But from much of the video material that I've seen of what's going on in the Middle East, specifically Syria, is that we, the Russians, and other people are absolutely demolishing. I think that the current administration has indicated that uh, as we capture these cities, it's going to be up to our uh, Arab allies to come in and occupy them and provide at least an initial semblance of government. One of the things I think that the United States has the capability to do is to help the Syrians rebuild their cities. CD undertaking a vast number. Mm -hmm. But uh, we have the, the experience and knowledge of how to put in the infrastructure of these cities. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it will also give an opportunity for many Syrians who have returned from their uh, homes in Jordan and Turkey to help with this. So I'll, I'll just uh, answer your question, Jack. Uh, for those of you that can't hear uh, up there, raise the question, what about Syria and the devastation there, and what does that mean for us now uh, and for the region? I think it's fascinating because, you know, when the Syria dilemma popped up uh, when the Civil War was starting in 2011, I was working a lot in Washington and talking with some of the people that are making decisions there. And they really wanted to avoid, uh, you know, falling into something like Iraq before and not making a situation worse. And yet, I don't know how it could be much worse than it is right now. There's about seven million people either internally displaced or uh, fleeing into Europe or wherever they could go. I was in Morocco, which is about a thousand miles away from Syria, maybe farther, people would know. There were Syrians there, and I see them in Jordan all the time, and it's destabilizing to a lot of those places. So what can we do uh, in future about Syria? It's going to take an international effort. First, uh, you have to stop the fighting. That's the first thing. And in Bosnia, where my wife Lisa uh, worked on that issue, they kind of tired themselves out. And when that moment was happening, that's when the West kind of got together and said, OK, knock it off, or we're going to use air power against you. And we were able to stop it then. So there are efforts. I think the Russians, everybody that doesn't really get along well, understands that this has gotten out of control 
and it could make things much worse. It could get out of hand. So what do we have to do to rebuild? International effort, once a peace assemblance is established, it can't be the United States on the ground in a very visible way, but I would say it should be Saudi and Gulf money and American expertise. And I think we need to lend our unique capabilities to efforts. So that's in the military sense, that's always things like intelligence, like um, you know drones if you're doing strikes, things that other powers don't really have. Um, and I think working together we might have a chance to rebuild. It will take years and it uh, will not be easy. But um, yeah, and I think that Syria shows how everything's interconnected and you can walk away from a situation or not want to get involved um, but it catches up with you. The world is far too small now, and you can see it rippling out, the effects of that. Yes, Paul. Well, I was in the United States, and I was talking about they, I was the news that they came to an agreement. What was the agreement in your uh, Paul asked me what the agreement in Syria was. I was in a hotel room in Morocco, half asleep, when I uh, heard about it, so I can't really represent it well. But in essence, what they were saying was they're going to try to pull apart the kind of reasonable Syrian rebels away from the Al-Qaeda-inspired ones, separate them. That gives the Russians no excuse to bomb everybody, because that's what they were doing pretty indiscriminately. Um, and then there'll be a kind of ceasefire between the Syrian government forces and the good rebels. So, you know, the Russians have to bring their ally to heel. That's basically what has to happen. Um, and whether they do or not always goes back to Russian self-interest, and I think they see that this is getting out of control. And, um, and so we'll hope for the best. Yes, sir. You noted that a lot of the leadership in reconstructing, rebuilding, has to come from the Arab world itself. I worked in the Arab world for a couple of years, and when you look right now at the last five or ten years, we've seen precious little real diplomatic, military reconstruction ability come from Saudi or the Kuwaitis, the Bahrainis, anyone, Egypt. So how can we hope that the leadership from their own world, from the Arab world, which is so essential for future stability, is going to occur because it just hasn't, has it? Have I missed something in the last 10 years? It could actually be worse over there in some ways. The Saudis uh, have put billions into Egypt in a bid to stabilize it. They've been pursuing a war against uh, rebels in Yemen may have made the situation kind of worse in some ways, or a little ham-handed about it. I, here's where I see positive developments. So on the, the strikes against ISIS in Iraq, uh, there were military elements from United Arab Emirates, from Jordan, Morocco, um, Saudi Arabia, all working together. They have the resources, or I should say certain elements there do have the money. So I think the U.S. has to be very uh, tough-minded about this. And if it comes to something like Syria, we have to say, well, guys, we're not footing the bill for this. We have to all do it together. Um, but, you know, right now there's a kind of internal civil war in, in the Middle East between Sunni and Shia, uh, Iran and its allies, and Saudi Arabia using proxies. Um, and uh, I think they're getting to the point where they realize it's boiling over and threatening them. So my hope is that uh, this ceasefire will take effect. Uh, you know, so will it be a perfect situation? No, but I think we have to make sure that each of these countries we're talking about that are in chaos, like Afghanistan, still in some chaos, but there's a return address now. There's a government you can actually work with. Um, Libya now is an issue because that state is broken down. So yeah, the Arab world has to take a lot more ownership of where it's uh, about their future as well. Yes, Bill. You mentioned earlier about we people and how are looking for the future and how we decide what that future will be. Uh, you, you stand here today informing us so that maybe we can make better decisions. Besides yourself, Dr. Weir, very, very connected to the U.S., are you encouraged by others who will rise to communicate with people? And when do you run for the governor? 
Yeah. <laughs> oh, good. Thank you. Thank you, one, for clapping. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, well, thanks, Bill. You know, there's a great new generation that's coming up, and sometimes they get a bad rap because they've got their heads buried in an iPhone. But I've worked with a lot of them um, that when 9-11 happened, they answered the call. And I worked with a lot of uh, men and women who have served overseas. Um, I think of Tulsi Gabbard, who I know, who's a congresswoman from Hawaii. Uh, she's like 35. And she was in, in the, I think, Army. Um, and I could go down a list of people. Seth Moulton in Massachusetts who's a congressman now. He's maybe 38. So they're there. And we don't hear those stories a lot. Uh, but that's a generation that is very plugged in about the need to remain engaged globally, that we can't pull up the drawbridge and truly be secure. Um, but they're also tempered by the conflict they've seen. And they, I can tell you, I spoke with several of them um, about Syria. They were very reluctant to get in there. So, you know, they're out there, Bill. They really are. And um, I think that I'm encouraged long term um, about where we're headed as a country. We, we always, you know, what did Churchill say about democracy? I, I said this when I was in Morocco to somebody. I said, you know, democracy is the worst system of all governments, or except all the others. And there's another saying about America, and I forget who said it, somebody will remind me, um, that Americans uh, do the right thing after exhausting all other options. And that was Churchill also. So I obviously like Winston Churchill. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm optimistic. Every generation wonders because you know all of you have been carrying the burden as taxpayers, as leaders in industry, uh, being in the military and looking out. I see so many people uh, who've done that. But I wouldn't trade places with any other country in the world right now, bar none. And so I'm bullish on America, no doubt about that. Yes, please. Okay, that's another. That should be another program. About three people will come to that one. Um, I'll, I'll be very quick about it. Connecticut has a Connecticut Port Authority, and we were the last state in the Northeast to get one. And the idea is to help the port communities work together um, to, uh, you know, win markets and opportunity, create jobs, good blue-collar jobs at ports quite often, and help small businesses, you know, export. And so, uh, yeah, I'm encouraged. We have some really uh, good people working on it. We just um, uh, got a guy from Rhode Island who is uh, running Quonset, and he's coming over uh, to do it for us. So I'm happy to talk with you more about that. And, um, you know, I don't have a boat. It's kind of embarrassing. I go on Charlie's boat and others, other people, but I, I appreciate them and understand. Uh, and not only is it uh, shipping and so forth, but it's about our communities, our coastal communities, quality of life. So it's aquaculture, it's uh, fishing, and all of that. And we are um, the point uh, of the tip of the spear on maritime issues. So we're supposed to advise the governor and the legislature on maritime issues. I'm just so impressed that Connecticut decided to find somebody who might be confident in this sort of position. Yeah. Well, I went out and found somebody who was confident, so that's that's how we did it, but thank you. Yes? Um, one of the things that I'm curious about, uh, one of the things that I know that a lot of very excited about was that the American troops in Saudi Arabia after the first World War in we had to look at a place to say that it was a huge area. Um, and then, if you remember now publicly, I heard this, but about 10 years ago, when we left, that I really didn't complete it. It was very Is it some sort of strategic calculation to do that? Mm -hmm. Do you know why we did that? Yes, and uh, thank you for your service in the U.S. Navy. I think I should uh, mention that for being underwater for six months at a stretch, being away from your family. So, thank you. Right, so bin Laden, um, you know, used that excuse. He said, well, the crusaders are on the soil of the holy sites, right? Mecca and Medina. Um, and uh, he was just kind of PO'd because he went to the king of Saudi Arabia and said, don't ask the Americans to help. I will raise a great army, you know, and beat back the Iraqis. And the king was like, yeah, uh, no. Um, so he had an axe to grind. Uh, why don't we have a base in Saudi? Now, I think there's you know, pr an appreciation about optics, not having us big and bold and out front. I can tell you when I worked in, in uh, Bahrain, for example, 
I would often work with Bahraini organizations in the United Nations, and often, you know, my organization, we weren't branded on any activities we were doing, um, and I think that's the way you have to proceed. In particular, to your question, we have a very large uh, air base in Qatar, which is basically closer to the action in some ways. And I think that was a decision made, you know, the Qataris were willing and they wanted to balance against the uh, rising Shia power, I think, in uh, Iran. And yeah, I think there was probably some of that, that they didn't want to have the excuse of the American presence on the ground. Uh, yes, I right think. To, thank you. A um, uh, couple things. My mom, who is here uh, today, I remember going to her with her to the store when I was a kid, which is like 40 years ago. And um, they would ask for her social security number for something. And she said, "I'm not giving you my social security number. Uh, that's kind of impossible not to do now." So yes, we've traded away information. Obviously, if you're on the internet, you know uh, the expectation of privacy is greatly reduced than it was in the past. And with the aggregation of data that's now possible, I mean, when I go on Facebook, I see you know news about the New England Patriots because they know that that's what I look at half the time. So um, yeah, it's a smaller world and the privacy that we had in the past is, is not there. Um, I think that uh, that might have happened without this. Uh, in terms of actual security procedures and those kind of things, um, it's not as extensive as, let's say, Israel. Um, so we haven't given up uh, specific liberties that you can never get back again. But I was in Hungary um, uh, six months ago, and they were looking at changing their constitution to say that if there was a threat of terrorist attack, they could suspend civil liberties, close the border, close the internet. I could go down a list. And I said to them, look, we have something called the Patriot Act in the United States, and we actually put in there a provision that every five years the law gets suspended. It's over. Because we kind of knew that these were extraordinary measures. And then we have to have a debate about it again. And that's what happened. And some of the provisions were kept and some were not. So we have to be active citizens. And the answer to your question, I mean, it's going to be it's a democracy and whatever people uh, demand. It, in Congress recently, there's been an interesting coalition of libertarians on the right, like Rand Paul, and then people on the left, like Bernie Sanders, kind of coming together, and they really push back against some of the Patriot Act provisions. So, yeah, we've lost, uh, I think, some of the expectation of privacy that it would be great to have. Um, on the other hand, I think the reality of the world is so connected now that the vulnerabilities, the threats are real, the vulnerabilities are real, but we have to always be on the alert to not surrender our liberties to demagogues and people that would tell us they can achieve total security, because they cannot. And uh, that's the thing that frightens me and that we always have to be vigilant against. Yes? Uh, 
Right, so if you couldn't hear it up there, um, the question was that some people look at anti-immigrant backlash and, and say, well, maybe um, you know, the terrorists are achieving some of their goals. Um, yeah, I, look, I, I can't say that fear is unjustified. <clears throat> are some terrorists going to get through when two million people are coming across borders? Well, yeah, maybe a couple are ill-intentioned while we save one, 1. 1.5 million people from hell. Uh, so that's a decision we have to make as grown-ups and people that understand that there's risk and we have to be living up to our example. So yeah, I mean, if you look at the rise of um, authoritarians in Western Europe, it's troubling. And when I was in uh, Hungary, again, this was on a, a kind of State Department, uh, some work. There's a castle on the hill in Budapest. If any of you have been there or seen the pictures, it's beautiful. And that's actually only about 150 years old. And I thought to myself, you know, since 150 years ago, there have been five different regimes in Hungary, and three of them were authoritarian. Uh, and when I was coming up in the 90s working in Eastern Europe, and my wife Lisa was a diplomat working in Eastern Europe, I think both of us had a sense of, you know, onward and upward, and Berlin Wall falls, and democracy takes root, and dictators try to push back, and we kick their ass, and we come together as the West, and it's pretty great, and I believe that, uh, but things are more complicated now, and I think what I've come away from it with is an appreciation that there is no manifest destiny in history. There's no, as the Marxist would say, a kind of dialectic driving to a particular place. It's each day. It's small decisions. It's all of us. And sometimes fighting as hard as you can to keep where you are is a victory. And so in the face of chaos coming out of Syria and millions of people crossing borders, the fact that you know Europe is still relatively together is probably a pretty good thing. Um, it's not ideal, but we're handling it. Um, yes, please. I agree with all the comments that I've heard, but I'm, I'm a strategist. I want to see strategy, and I think many people here in the United States want to see the same. They want to see something that is effective, they want to see some improvement, and they want to see that their commerce does something and does it well. Mm -hmm. And does not create a block. So, in a strategy, what would you recommend as a strategy to work with Syria? Because I think Syria, once you work with Syria as it is now, and if you do a good job, you can help the Arabic world, you can be an image or a symbol of improving things all around the world. How would you recommend Congress try and find a way to compromise? Because compromise should be the proper way to do things. To maybe make a, a, a way so that the Syrian people have been refugees can go back to their country and they can improve their country from within without doing it from without and creating mm -hmm. more conflict. Right. So what to do about Syria? I'll try to give you an answer in one minute or less. All right. <laughs> I have that luxury. I'm not, you know, a decision maker. Uh, so one thing I'd do, and now I'll uh, kind of offer constructive criticism to President Obama as he's on his way out. Uh, in the past, you know, sometimes you would have a delegation go overseas in an important diplomatic effort, and you'd include members of the other party. I think it would have been great, you know, if uh, President Obama asked John McCain or Lindsey Graham or some of these guys, I would have had them in on the Iran nuclear deal. And uh, maybe they don't agree with all of your points, but if they generally, if you call them in and you say, listen, we need, we need progress here. I need your help. I need you to help me. Um, so what to do on Syria in particular, that I would, I would recommend. It has to be a bipartisan approach. Neither party will get exactly what they want. Number one, the refugees, what to do. I think uh, Europe and the US and the Saudis have to fund um, <clears throat> putting the refugees, housing them in place. That basically means in Jordan, in Turkey, Europe is kind of at maxed out and can't handle this right now, but we have to take care of these folks. Number two, um, you look at the actual conflict on the ground and how to end it. I think we're probably going to have to accept that uh, elements of the Assad regime are going to be in place. We don't like that. <clears throat> That's just a reality. It's been six years and they haven't been blasted out yet. I'm not saying he does, 
with some of the people around him who are reasonable and haven't committed war crimes. Maybe they stay involved. Um, and I think we have to put up no-fly zones in the north on Syrian soil and allow Syrian refugees to be there, and that should be backed up by the power of the United States and NATO alliance, Russia, all of it. Um, so that, in, in that area, you start to begin to talk with Syrians about rebuilding their own society and making plans to do that. Uh, so, you know, those would be starters, um, and at a certain point, you would have to um, you know, weigh in, perhaps militarily in some way, again with air power, to uh, um, support uh, moderate elements such as they are. But it would be a long-term thing, and it's not easy, and that's why I say it has to be both parties kind of developing a strategy on this. The core of it is to take care of the refugees today, um, to uh, make your peace with some kind of alliance of forces there that aren't perfect, but are better than Islamic State. Uh, and then a stabilization force made up of uh, forces from the Arab and Muslim world. I know, it can't be us. So that would be a lot of Indonesians, Pakistanis. They have huge armies. You give them a little bit of resources, and they can do guard duty in Damascus. Yes? Uh, first of all, thanks for pulling it all together. Uh, I wanted to know what you think about the underlying religious causes of conflict in Syria, across the Middle East, and for that matter, behind terrorism. Uh, when you look at uh, what happened during the Arab Spring, it was very often a religious minority or majority, in the case maybe uh, Sunni or Shia overthrowing the you know, changing the balance and igniting conflict. And certainly uh, some of the igniters have been our own allies. I mean, the, the Saudi views on religious tolerance are about the same as the, the Catholics and Protestants in the early Renaissance or the Middle Ages. There is no mention of freedom of conscience. And still, both the Saudis are suffering from terrorism. And uh, at second thoughts, I think there is a tendency to tolerate uh, extremist groups to support them in Syria, uh, to indulge in extreme actions at home against the religious minorities. We see the same thing uh, on the, Sh the Shia on the other side uh, in Iraq. Yeah. So where is the U.S. voice saying, look at the U.N. Charter, what about freedom of conscience? Um, you are exacerbating the conflict. Right. What, what are we doing? What should we do? Mm -hmm. It's a good point because you have some people that eh, are, you know, in the class of what you'd call realists. So George Bush, actually, George W. Bush, I'd say, was an idealist. You know, he talked about transforming the Middle East. He wanted to support, um, you know, democracy as we know it in the Middle East, which is a tremendous uh, challenge. Um, and Barack Obama and his team, I think, in some ways are a reaction to that. They're actually kind of realists. I do a lot of kind of democracy support work in other countries. Uh, that's helping build political parties, just giving them the tools to do what parties do, working with elected officials to strengthen their capacity. And, you know, in the, the Bush years, there, there were a lot of resources for those things. And there's more skepticism now. I think that we shouldn't be. I think we have to believe and be confident in our own values, understand that they're not going to happen overnight. Uh, I think we have to stand up for religious minorities that are persecuted in the Middle East currently by whoever's doing it. We have to stand up and say that's wrong. I remember, uh, you know, when I was in uh, the Balkans and I had friends who were Albanians and they said, oh, Ameri you know, America is Albania, is uh, Kosovar Albania's best friend. And I said, yes, we are great friends. And I said, but understand, if you had done to the Serbs what they were doing to you, we would have come over here and, you know, been against you. And they kind of laughed, like, no, it's not true. And I'm like, no, it is. <laughs> it is. Uh, so we have to stand up and be clear about our values. It doesn't mean we impose them. It doesn't mean that we can affect an outcome. I think we have to understand there are the real religious tensions in the Middle East. We cannot presume to... Uh, you know, tell them what to do about that, uh, and we have to navigate carefully. So, yeah, Peter, all of it's true. 
uh, that you say. And I think what we can do is simply be true to who we are, hope that by our example it inspires some people. The challenge for democracy long term in the Middle East is they didn't have much civil society in countries. What is civil society? That's a big word. You know what it is? It's this, like the Labrua Center. It's a bunch of people that came together, set up a form of governance, raised money, and did stuff. And there were like, you know, 200, or, no, there was more like 1,000 nonprofits in southeastern Connecticut. Is that right? That's civil society. It's not the government or some functionary kind of telling you how to live your life. But in a lot of these societies, that's what they had for a long time. And so when you remove the top layer by force in, let's say, Libya or Iraq or other places, yeah, there's going to be some chaos because they don't have those institutions or traditions. So it will take time for stability. I won't say democracy, just some sense of stability in that region. Oh, you're, you're shy now. No? Okay, we we'll back. Listening to all this, in hindsight, we have a young world quarterback. Would you say the Arab Spring was a lost opportunity? Or would you say it was this game? What a great question. Um, so the question was, was the uh, Arab Spring a lost opportunity? Um, <clears throat> I'll, I'll tell you uh, my, a very personal observation uh, because you know, I was inspired by what happened in Eastern Europe and, uh, and in some Latin American countries, uh, the democratic change was happening. I remember watching Tahir Square, which was where you know, the overthrow of Mubarak was happening. And for about two seconds, I was kind of like, yeah, great, you know, this is like the wave of freedom happening. And then uh, very shortly after that, I thought, because we had, we have our son here tonight, he was about two then, three, and I thought, I hope that my son never has to go over there um, or get you know, killed in a building in New York because of the chaos that would emanate from there, to be blunt. Uh, and I, that's how I view the Arab Spring, is that there are some good for forces that are emerging, I was uh, honored to work you know, with some of them while I was there over the past many years. Um, and I think what we can do as a country is work closely with European allies, with East Asian allies that are democratic, support those forces, speak up on behalf of minorities that are persecuted. Um, and, but we cannot uh, dictate the kind of change that's going to happen. There's going to be as if we couldn't tell uh, what you see there now, that kind of upheaval will go on you know, for a while. Uh, and we're not going to be able to control it. And what we don't need is to have, I mean, criticism is always important, but we're going to have to understand and develop a strategy uh, with both political parties in the U.S. acknowledging it's going to be a time of disruption in that region. It's not some president's fault that it all broke out. This just kind of emerges, because guess what? We actually don't control everything in the world. These are real societies with their own trajectories and their own traditions. You know, I was in Morocco. They have like 30-some million people. It's a vibrant place. And we don't control everything that's going on in these places. It's not really an answer, but let's just say I'm long-term optimistic, having met with a lot of the young people in the Middle East, but it's going to be a rocky road. And I think we have to be prepared to partner with uh, people of goodwill in the area and not turn our backs on, on all of it, even though it's tempting to try to do so. Yes? 9-11 um, was kind of like the wake of call for many people in terms of understanding that uh, the threat from Islam. But it got very narrowly focused to you know, radical militant Islam. And my question is, some of the things that are more subtle can be, because it's not simply just a religion, it's also a political entity. Um, you know, it's combined. So we see in Europe and many other places where they, you know, they have a strategy to get in, to multiply, to get into school boards and, you know, be elected at local level mayors and so forth. Um, so I guess my question is, um, how does the administration view that? Do they even view that as a threat? Is that one of the, um, in your vulnerability assessment, is that one of the things that came up? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, our core strategy um, was 
target the terrorists, protect the homeland, and prevent the rise of future terrorists. I, by strategy, I say what I worked on with the committee. That was kind of it. And I said, you have to do all three of those or none of it works. And you have to do all three of them about equally and not just be top heavy on one of them. Um, so countering violent extremism is something that, yes, is being talked about in DC. It's a huge challenge how to do it. Uh, but you know, I wouldn't say that you know, Islam is a political movement or there's like a central brain behind all of, This is like 1.5 million pe billion people. Uh, some would say that some of the problem is that there is not you know, one authority. Uh, there's no pope. So some jerk with a storefront can uh, recruit and say that he's speaking uh, on behalf of the Almighty. And unfortunately, you have those. So it's interesting in Morocco, as I just mentioned that, the political authority is also the religious. The king is a descendant of Muhammad, so he has some authority to speak on these matters. And as I said, he said, if you do terrorism in the name of Islam, you'll go to hell. So, you know, complex place, enormous place, but yes, how to counter those radical voices is a conversation that has been going on for a long time. Yes, over here. Right. By, by homegrown, you mean um, uh, people from the guy who blew up the Oklahoma City building, right? Who was, you know, looked like me. Well, maybe 25 years younger than me, but you know what I mean. He's your average white guy. Um, yeah, look, I, I think the real uh, point here about why you know, we can never eliminate terrorism or terrorist threats is because for two uh, things that have been happening in the last 25 years with great rapidity. One is the democratization of information. You think about what's happened in the last 25 years. If you're, you wanted your voice out there to the public back then, you had to get past the editor of the New London Day, for example. Now I can have you know, my Facebook page and da -da -da -da, you know, Twitter, whatever, right? So there's information everywhere and connection so that also means the bad guys can find others like them, and they can network. That's a democratization of information. Then the second, I'd say, is the democratization of violence, because you actually have the ability, because of technology, to um, find powerful explosives, weapons, training, all of it. And so it used to be the state was kind of, and by state I mean national government, had a monopoly on violence, basically. And they were responsible to the leader or to the public. And now very small groups can organize, you know, plan and carry out violent activity. Um, so that's going to be with us. And there will always be the disaffected and the lunatics. And they'll always be able to pull off something. Um, but, you know, all that said, uh, you, have to, you have to see the positives that have come out of those two trends as well. Not violence, but but of information and our ability to connect. And there's 150 people in here today because we were able to connect with each other. And there were 150 people at, uh, at Paula's event earlier today uh, who were remembering her daughter and her granddaughter. And that positive power is absolutely enough to push back against um, any kind of long-term dark trend as I see it, but it won't guarantee total security. Yes? Do you think Snowden is a valid whistleblower or a traitor? No. <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. See, this guy Snowden. Yeah, yeah, I do not think he had exhausted the whistleblower uh, avenues, and he, he should have done that. Here's my problems with Edward Snowden. Um, he's acting like, and also uh, Assange there, with a new WikiLeaks guy. Um, both of them sit there on Russian state TV. 
and talk about how you know the U.S. is so secretive and the U.S. does this and that. And let me tell you, you know, with Putin as your patron, that says a lot about your motivation. Um, I, I, I think. No, thank you again. Thank you, one. So, no, so look, I, I think uh, the leaks damaged a lot of uh, U.S. intelligence gathering capabilities at the time damaged uh, uh, the sources and methods we were using, brought that, uh, harm to that effort. Uh, and while uh, it's interesting, I kind of knew about that program anyway, reading something in the Post like six months before that, the contours of it, where there was a guy that was speaking at my think tank at the time in DC, and I was like, oh, I think this is the kind of collection they're doing, of uh, meaning the NSA, and you know, if, if I were calling people, and I was, I was living overseas, they had the ability, under the Constitution, to kind of listen in or listen for keywords or look at my internet traffic, and if there's a keyword, I kind of knew that. Why, you know, why did he actually need to expose names of people, same with the WikiLeaks guy, names of people helping us um, out there? So that was quite wrong. Um, now, Congress wasn't doing its job of oversight, uh, so I think that we did need to have a debate about the extent of the intelligence collection we were doing, and now we have had a debate, and there have been some adjustments. So that sounds like maybe a, a politician answer for you, but, <laughs> but I, I think, you know, um, not one of my favorite guys, that's for sure. I'm getting the high sign. Thank you um, very much for coming out. Of the